Hello everyone, I hope you're enjoying the conference. We're just about to start the Thought Leaders Plenary, but before we do, here's a message from Bård Beigal Sohel, Director General of the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, to remind us of why we've come together today. Think about it, how interconnected we are. What happened on a so-called wet market in the city of Wuhan, China, a city very few Westerners knew of until recently, has now been dominating our lives for more than half a year. Just in a few months, a certain incident spread to become the most important for everyone all over the world. And it is probably also an example of something else. Uh, the fact that our contact with nature has changed, that man is moving into pristine areas, getting closer to wildlife, and thus that the contacts become more often. And we know now, now that several uh, pandemics over some time is uh, thought to have been created or to originate from wildlife, from animals. This is only one of the many examples of what has to be a leading and important debate of our century, how we use our lands and how we pre preserve nature. After fossil fuels, land use is the second most important uh, uh, reason for climate change. It could be as much as 30% of the solution preserving our rainforest and boreal forest, uh, our peatlands and other carbon rich parts of nature. Uh, and it's a massive change in our food systems and our land use that is needed. For preserving biodiversity, so important for our food, our energy, our medicines, our clothes, our lives. Uh, changing our land use and preserving nature uh, is the most important thing to deal with. We simply have to take better care of our natural habitats. We have to change massively our food systems and the way we produce. And we have to make land use a, a leading issue in international debates on sustainability. I wish you well the next few days of, uh, of doing that. Uh, I look forward to participating and I look forward to continuing on behalf of Norad uh, to support your work. Hello again and welcome to the Thought Leaders in Biodiversity Plenary. As the world faces a web of concurrent crises, there are a number of experts who are working to inspire hope and trust in the future. GLF has gathered some of these leaders into a single digital space to share with us their vision on the state of biodiversity. So make yourselves comfortable as we immerse ourselves into the insights of seven such leaders from around the world on why biodiversity is essential to building back better. But we also wanna hear from you. So please do use the chat to share your own thoughts or engage in a conversation with the rest of the audience. Our first thought leader is Carol Dieschberg, Minister for the Environment, Climate and Sustainable Development for Luxembourg. She starts us off with what we need to do to create the new normal. Representatives of youth, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, representatives of youth, actors of change. It's a pleasure to be with you at this year's Global Landscapes Forum on biodiversity under the topic One World, One Health. The question I was asked to address is why is biodiversity essential to build back better? The COVID-19 pandemic reminds us how closely our environment and our well-being are linked. It's, it reminds us very impressively how closely human health and environmental health are linked. The crisis also has shown us how vulnerable we are, how vulnerable our economies and societies are. It reminds us that everything is linked and that we have to react 
accordingly. This does mean that we do not only need to build back better, have better health systems, but also make a radical change in the way we produce, we consume and live. We learned some lessons altogether. We had our wake-up call reflecting what our priorities are. Health, protecting our families, protecting those we love. Secondly, solidarity. Only by working together we will find solutions to the crisis we see now. Not only to the health crisis, but also to the crisis related to climate and biodiversity loss. Third point, if we all agree on the urgency of a crisis, we are able to act boldly. We are able to change everything in a very short time. Just think about the kids playing out in the middle of the streets that normally are crowded by cars. Just think about those very calm moments where we all appreciated nature. If we want to change small things, you have to do things differently. But if we want to change the world, we will have to look at it differently and we will have to have everyone on board. Rethink, recreate, the new normal is what we need right now and we have to take into account planetary boundaries, climate crisis and biodiversity loss. Because biodiversity is the foundation of all. It's not only for nature protection, but for protecting humans, for protecting us, for protecting our children and giving them hope that we need to take into account our nature if we make those future plans. So it's only by taking this into account that we will be more resilient. It's only by choosing, for instance, nature-based solutions that we will be able to speak about the benefits about tourism, sustainable tourism, benefits for a region, water protection, but also new jobs. And these are sustainable jobs if we create it with nature instead of against nature. And I think it's these stories that politicians have to tell. That this crisis also gives us a single window of opportunity to create cool benefits and sustainable jobs. What do we need to do? First of all, mainstreaming and redirecting investment. So it's essential to have public and private funding going into the right direction. Secondly, we need a holistic approach. The current GDP growth is regarded to be the most important indicator to measure success. But this is not reality. We rely on very simplistic, very often unique indicators, whereas the world is more complex. That's why we need to have a holistic approach and go away and have a third, a right set of indicators. Biodiversity needs to be taken into account, climate change, because if biodiversity is the foundation of life, then it also needs to be the foundation of our thoughts and acts in a common. So we need this new approach. We need to take into account natural capital as, and this is one of the tools that we need to foster in order to accelerate the transition towards a fairer, a more sustainable world, a life in harmony with nature, in harmony with people. Fourth point I want to make is that we have to get rid of all harmful subsidies. There's no alternative to redirect subsidies that are harmful for nature. Fossil fuel subsidies alone account for 5.2 trillion US dollars annually. It's about efficiency. Imagine if we would take this money in order to restore degraded ecosystems. Fifth point I want to make is about getting everyone on board. So over the past years in Luxembourg we had a whole of a government approach. We designed an international climate finance 
um, ecosystem, I would say, in order to have not only the government on board with the finance minister, but also the private sector, because we need really everyone on board if we want really to reduce deforestation and if we want uh, to avoid land degradation. We actively support a lot of projects um, and blending finance because we see that there is an opportunity also for the private sector, for investment funds, uh, funds and for the finance sector of Luxembourg. Over the past years we have developed into a hub for natural capital funds and we see increasing interest from private sector to invest more into natural capital, forestry, landscape restoration in developing countries. And you probably already have heard from our Forestry and Climate Change Fund, from the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund, uh, to which Luxembourg provided first loss guarantee through the Luxembourg ERB Climate Finance Platform, or you heard about the Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility. So we as politicians, together with the private sector, need to speak about those success stories. Also, we need to speak about the beautiful pictures and we need to stay in lead. This seems very simple. Luxembourg for years already supports uh, uh, an international climate uh, finance funding, the Vanishing Treasures program led by the UNEP. This program aims at generating a maximum synergy between climate change adaptation of local communities and biodiversity conservation, in particular focus on mountain flagship species like the gorilla, the snow leopard and the royal Bengal tiger. So think about the pictures, the positive images that we can all create if we together protect, protect nature. Today I'm very happy to announce that this week Luxembourg launched together with Germany, UNEP and the Frankfurt School of Finance a restoration seed capital financing facility. So it's a new instrument, a new vehicle that will provide support to young fund managers and investment advisors for crucial early stage of their projects. And I think it's by capacity building and telling the right story that we will provide help and that we will be able to solve the crisis that we are facing. So last time I spoke at the Global Landscape Forum in Luxembourg, I was surprised how conscious the private sector already was. Today I know that you are there, that we are all actors of change and I wish you a wonderful conference and I wish that we all work together in order to create a resilient future. Thank you. Robert Nassi, Director General of the Centre for International Forestry Research, who reminds us of what biodiversity in action looks like. Okay, greetings, uh, everybody. Welcome to the GLF and welcome to the C4 campus, where I'm going to uh, give you a few ideas and thoughts about what biodiversity is. And start by a sort of a local experiment. You see these, these, these logs here. And they were cut a few years ago. And uh, I will show you what biodiversity in action is. Let's see what it does. If you let them for a few years, you can see that they are colonized by vegetation. I mean, you can see some manioc, some cassava here. And then if you let them a little bit longer, you see that you are slowly, but not so slowly, reconstituting some forest because the normal ecosystem here is forest. So that's the effect of biodiversity, and biodiversity is what sustains our existence. Without biodiversity, there is no food, there is hardly any medicine, and there is no way that the human can survive. So the question that we have to ask ourselves now is that have we failed uh, biodiversity for the sake of development and the answer unfortunately is yes. And uh, in the 60s uh, with the publication of the book Silent Spring by uh, Rachel Carson, um, 
there was a, a very strong uh, environmental lobby in terms of people were protesting against uh, oil spill, against uh, logging, against uh, chemicals. But, but in the end, what we end up is the environmentalist uh, lobby uh, was just creating a, a group of organizations and a group of people that were mainly monitoring the decrease and, and looking at this is the doomsday scenario, we are going to lose biodiversity, but not doing much, unfortunately, uh, at least on the global scale. I mean, locally people were doing things, but, and, and as a result, uh, we are now uh, in a stage where we have a risk of an impending biodiversity collapse. If you look at the five mass extension uh, that occurred before, uh, only one has been uh, tentatively uh, uh, provoked by uh, uh, the fall of an asteroid. The four other mass extensions have been triggered by climate change, by a volcano or by so. So, and we are living now in the sixth mass extension and we are also having a very strong climate change event. Uh, and so there is a role for science uh, in doing this. And, and scientists really need to look at the way system work. I mean, how do you bring together social and biophysical science to understand uh, what will happen, what will be the feedback look, how we can solve the problem, how we can shift from fossil fuel energy into uh, renewable energy. And, and, and first of all, above all, we need to find ways to protect the biodiversity we have and to restore the biodiversity we lost because this will be the basis for survival and adaptation. And we need to, to move together and, and create a movement in terms of taking the hard decision and making the sacrifice that we have to do uh, on an equitable manner to protect the biodiversity, uh, mitigate and adapt to climate change and ultimately ensure the survival of, of our civilization or better civilization. And for that, a platform like the Global Landscape Forum is very important because this is a platform where we bring all components on, on the society, the scientific, the private, the communities and the public sector and we try to create a movement where in fact we are going to push for this change, building back better in terms of preserving biodiversity, mitigating and adapting to climate change and ultimately having a better world. Now the question is can we do it? I think so. The most important question is that are we ready to do it or do we want to do it? I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert, um, posing that very uh, central question, I guess. Um, also nice to, to see Robert on campus there. So from forests to food, uh, Stefan Schmitz, executive director of Crop Trust, highlights why it has never been more critical to conserve crop diversity. Hello, I'm Stefan Schmitz, the executive director of the Crop Trust. Thank you for joining me here today. A conference on the conservation of our planet's biodiversity could not have come at a more critical time. Just look at the figures cited in a recent analysis by the insurance firm Swissway. More than half of global GDP, so 42 trillion US dollars, depends on high functioning biodiversity and more than a fifth of countries worldwide are at risk from ecosystem collapse as biodiversity declines. These figures are staggering, and I thank the Global Landscape Forum for bringing us together here today in the midst of this crisis to look for solutions together. At the Crop Trust, when we talk about our mission, certain words arise frequently. Biodiversity is one such word, of course. One part of agricultural biodiversity, crop diversity, is our reason for being. Food security is another frequently used phrase, as is conservation. The conservation of crop diversity is crucial for food security. Another word that we use a lot is forever. Our mission is to safeguard crop diversity to support food security for everyone, forever. 
against the real state of our natural environment with so much destruction, loss and insecurity, the word forever seems a whimsical concept. But forever is another word for sustainable. And isn't it the concept of sustainability that brings us together what we are all striving for? The Crop Trust is laying the foundations for conserving crop diversity in perpetuity by raising an endowment that will support key collection of crop diversity in gene banks forever. And there is another forever. When biodiversity is lost, it is lost forever. Food plants are among the biodiversity being destroyed in this ongoing global crisis. 40% of plant species are facing extinction. That includes the wild relatives of important crops. This loss is massive and irreversible. When we lose this biodiversity, we lose options. We lose resilience. We lose potential. We lose solutions. Crop wild relatives might have the genes to help crops adapt to climate change or to new pests and diseases for new tastes, colors, and textures. The causes of biodiversity loss are complex and many, and the threats are constantly evolving. And for how long will there be threats to diversity? Forever. To plan for forever is bold. It takes courage and vision. Yet forever is a common goal that unites everyone at this conference. We are not fighting to save biodiversity for one decade or even one century. We need to conserve it forever. Conservation is not passive. A commitment to conservation is a commitment to action. First, conservation takes knowledge, and this knowledge must be updated continuously. Second, conservation demands vigilance. Gene banks need ongoing maintenance, regular upgrades, reliable electricity. A single budget cut or lapse in management could mean the loss of diversity forever. Third, conservation means tireless development of new technology to preserve crops, to evaluate traits, to breed improved crops. Fourth, conservation means managing and exchanging information systems on gene banks and their holdings. Fifth, conservation means urgently identifying, collecting, and safeguarding threatened diversity. In one of our project, national partners in 26 countries have brought more than four and a half thousand samples of crop wild relatives into their gene banks. Yet many more are at risk. Six, the conservation means building communities of practice and raising awareness from informing farmers and breeders of the seeds availability to informing consumers of the importance of the rich variety of foods they can eat. Yet this barely scratches the surface of the work that is essential to conserve agricultural biodiversity and secure food forever. No doubt many of us have lists of critical ongoing work, and all of us are operating in an environment characterized by the short term project funding, policies, market trends, in an environment that is inherently unpredictable, insecure, and unsettled, which is precisely why we at the Crop Trust keep our thoughts on forever. It is why forever is built into our very structure with our endowment fund and our commitments to funding in perpetuity. We estimate the fund must reach $850 million to secure key collections of crop diversity forever. So far, we have secured one-third that amount, thanks to the vision of governments, private sector, and even individuals. But that means we have half a billion dollars to go. By comparison, the value of crop improvement is estimated well into the tens of billions of dollars. But you can't improve crops without continued access to their genetic diversity. And that's before we even begin to consider the options we are providing for the future, or the billions of lives at stake. Biodiversity is priceless. Yet our short-term world persists in squandering it, 
when we destroy biodiversity, we are gambling away our options for the future. It is time to decide if we will continue to gamble with our future or if we are willing to invest in it. Because the actions we take today will last forever. Thank you for listening. Be well. Thank you, Stefan. And now to Galina Angarova, Executive Director of Cultural Survival. As a member of the Indigenous Buryat people of Siberia, she represents Indigenous people's understanding of the reciprocity of people and place. Here she says with us what biocultural diversity really means. Greetings, dear friends. My name is Galina Angarova, and I come from the Iherit Nation of the Buryat people in Siberia. I'm delivering this message from the territory of the Ohlone people, where I live and work, and which is now known the San Francisco Bay Area. Due the, to the high wind and fire alert, I'm speaking from home, not from the natural setting as other speakers. I'm an Indigenous rights activist and the executive director of Cultural Survival. It's a 48-year-old Indigenous rights organization that advocates for Indigenous people's rights and supports Indigenous communities' self-determination, cultures, and political resilience since 1972. I was born and raised in a traditional community where storytelling, traditional ceremonies, tending to the land, and communicating with our ancestors was part of our daily lives. I truly believe that we indigenous peoples are key partners in land and biodiversity protection and sustainability. I want to speak not only to the importance of biological diversity, but rather, rather to the importance of biocultural diversity, which recognizes the equal role of humans and nature in this symbiosis called Mother Earth. It is an interdependent relationship between people and place, culture and ecology, and they cannot exist without one another. Biodiversity is tied to cultural diversity, and they rely on each other to exist and thrive. As indigenous peoples, we have co-evolved with our landscapes, and the landscapes have co-evolved with us. We are inseparable. The Amazon wouldn't be the Amazon if there hadn't been a relationship that has existed since the time immemorial between the Amazon and its people. We indigenous peoples are the experts of our own environments. We carry the knowledge of our land and biodiversity in our languages. Our languages reflect the silhouettes of our landscapes and nature is mimicked in our sounds, in our dances, and in our songs. Furthermore, our worldview, our traditional knowledge, our cultures, and cosmovisions are all reflected in our languages. Among indigenous cultures, every language emerges from a specific place. Inuit people have dozens of words for snow. Polynesian languages have dozens of words for water ripples. There are over 4,000 indigenous languages in the world, and all of them have traditional knowledge about bird biodiversity protection embedded in them. There are over 5,000 varieties of potatoes in the Andes, and this diversity is a result of the Andean indigenous communities and nature working together. And this is why biodiversity cannot exist without cultural and language diversity. My first understanding of the natural environment came from my grandmother. I witnessed when my grandmother would wake up in the morning and would know the, uh, the weather for the day, whether it would be raining or snowing, it would be windy. She would know what the harvest of wild strawberries and wild blueberries would be like in the spring, way before the harvest in the fall. She knew so many things that are hidden from the regular eye just because she was off that land. In fact, she was more just part of the land. She was the land and the land was her. 
The land and I share the DNA and I carry the microbiome of the land I live on. And just like my grandmother, I'm the land and the land is me. The intimate relationship to your land and your environment is the basis of our indigenous worldview, which in its turn provides us with a, with a set of instructions, values, and principles. And they are reciprocity, prosperity, equity, humility, trust, relationships, and respect. We indigenous peoples learn from the land, the mother of all mothers, to reciprocate when we tend to the land. And she gives back to us in the form of harvest. We take only what we need and give back to the life force that nourishes us. And that translates into prosperity and abundance. Indigenous peoples understand that we humans are not the only or the highest intelligence on this planet. And that comes from the place of humility. It teaches us to treat people, animals, plants, rocks, rivers, mountains with respect and love and equity. Our actions and solutions are deeply rooted in our worldviews and values and informed by our millennia old relationship to the land. As indigenous peoples, we have a gift to the world. It is the knowledge and understanding of how to live with the environments in a reciprocal way that upholds both the spiritual and ecological integrity of the land, protecting and sustaining by the biological diversity of the place. Recent research demonstrates that although indigenous peoples around the globe uh, represent only 6.2% of the global population, they manage and hold tenure for almost 25% of the, uh, the world's land surface. And those territories are home to almost 80% of the remaining biological diversity. When indigenous people's rights are respected and upheld, they're able to steward these lands in ways that prevent fossil fuels, um, extraction, maintain carbon capturing forests, and protect biological diversity. But to sustain our environments indefinitely, indigenous peoples must not have not just a seat at the table, but their leadership and expertise should be centered, trusted, and honored. Although indigenous peoples have long been excluded from the conservation movement, both physically evicted from the conservation lands and politically excluded from international climate negotiations and discussions, more than ever, it is being recognized that indigenous people's leadership in forest protection, traditional agriculture and traditional knowledge on biodiversity is crucial uh, for our continued existence as species on this planet. Moreover, social and environmental benefits and consequences are interdependent and interrelated. Planting a few acres of trees have will have very little impact on reversing climate change if our collective behaviors continue to extract, exploit, and commodify our environments. Rather, we must address the root causes of the planetary crisis that we're in, a disconnection between the human beings and the planet. Indigenous wisdom, leadership, and our ancestral knowledge can guide the world towards a shift in mindset about the relationship to the land, bringing collective changed behavior and supporting long-term resiliency and sustainability of the natural world. Thank you, Bairla. Thank you, Galina. Um, a much needed message of, of humility there. Um, so moving from indigenous peoples to small scale farmers, next we have President Gilbert Hongbo of IFAD, who helps us take a look at biodiversity through the lens of rural development. Good afternoon. I am honored that IFAD is part of such a distinguished group. At IFAD, we see biodiversity as the backbone of life. Conserving biodiversity is a central element of IFAD investments 
in agriculture and rural development and must guide our efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. As we all know, COVID-19 is putting the 2030 Agenda at risk. But while the pandemic creates challenges, it also provides opportunities. In the post-pandemic world, biodiversity will be key to building back better, to end hunger, improve food systems, and preserve the Earth's precious resources. Today, let us look at biodiversity through the lenses of rural development. Rural people depend on natural resources for their livelihoods. They depend on clean water and a fertile soil. Diverse cropping systems help the resilience of small-scale farmers to climate change, environmental degradation, pests, and disease. Small-scale farmers are also the most vulnerable to the impact of biodiversity loss, environmental degradation, and climate change. And if farmers use unsustainable agricultural practices, they make these problems worse. This is why sustainable and inclusive rural transformation is a pivotal area of investment. It can tackle the global biosphere crisis and the burdens of poverty, food insecurity, and malnutrition. It can help correct the social injustices that so many rural people face. And it can help small-scale farmers become part of the solution. By raising awareness of the links between agricultural, biodiversity, environment, and climate, we can bring biodiversity and small-scale farming into the mainstream of investment agenda. The key word here is investment. Governments should not be distracted by the need for short-term economic gains. To feed the future and avoid further damage to biodiversity, they need to focus on long-term sustainable rural transformation to truly build back better. Investment in innovations and new nature-based solutions are crucial to achieving effective, inclusive, and sustainable rural transformation. If it has been supporting nature-based solutions for some time, and they are evident throughout our adaptation for smallholder agricultural program, ASAP, across the globe, in Bolivia, for example, Farmers are combining traditional knowledge with modern science to develop ecosystem-based solutions. One community is developing a beekeeping business that incorporates native tree species and encourages reforestation. Another example is the restoration of riverbanks with native trees and bushes to prevent erosion. This combination of upstream and downstream investments makes the entire watershed more resilient in the face of frequent flooding. ASA promotes diversified agricultural systems with high level of agrobiodiversity. This promotes a healthy biosphere and enhances agricultural productivity. Ladies and gentlemen, Threats to biodiversity not only put farmers at risk, they ripple across the globe. Why? Because global food security rests on the backs of small-scale farmers who produce half of the world's food calories. It is a terrible irony that the small-scale producers who provide so much of our food often lack food themselves. If we are serious about building back better, we need to start with biodiversity. And if we are serious about biodiversity, we need to start with small-scale farmers. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Gilbert, for sharing examples of some solutions there. 
And next we hear from Ma Jun, Director of the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs in China. Thank you, Ma Jun, for sharing with us how China is responding to the challenge of biodiversity loss. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to the Global Landscape Forum and to review the biodiversity situation. Globally, biodiversity is declining at an unprecedented rate. Over the past half century, we have lost more than two thirds of the bio of the animal population monitored, and the freshwater biodiversity have taken the hardest hit. In China, the challenge is equally severe. The young fish and fish eggs of the Yangtze River have dropped by about 90%. We're glad to see that many countries have stepped up their efforts to combat biodiversity loss, including China, with the largest, world's largest reforest uh, project going on. We're glad to see that uh, uh, many countries have stepped up their efforts to combat uh, biodiversity loss. In China, we have rolled out the world's largest reforestation project and over the past several years, the spending on biodiversity protection have been increased dramatically. And, and we have just launched a 10 year fishing ban across the entire Yangtze River. Still, we need to understand um, that globally, the pressure driving the decline is still persistent, even intensifying. I think much of that is because today the, the biodiversity pressure is not just coming from local factors, but it is intertwined with this very complex globalized manufacturing, sourcing, and investment and even consumption. With this situation, we have to extensively broaden the participation from stakeholders uh, globally. But one of the major obstacles is that um, well, many people heard about this. Uh, they, they have heard about this term biodiversity, but most of them actually don't understand the meaning of it. To help the public build awareness on biodiversity, we have just launched the, a new project called Biodiversity Map. We hope to tap into the new IT technology, the map, mapping technology to help people visualize this issue to help uh, all this information on biodiversity um, spread beyond the scope of the uh, experts, policy experts and scientists. The big data platform means to put all the red line zones and protected areas, which account for about 25% of the land mass in China um, on digital map and cross link them with the knowledge and information on the species they protect and um, overlaying that with the uh, air quality, water quality, and, um, and, and with the performance records of uh, millions of factories. Uh, it will help people take the stock on what we have got, what, have, what we are trying to protect and uh, what is in danger. The big data solution have already helped with uh, China's uh, uh, pollution control efforts uh, with the uh, 1.8 million records uh, of violations uh, openly accessible uh, in our database. And with uh, the world's uh, first real-time disclosure of online monitoring data for tens of thousands of some of the largest meters available, uh, the all this performance data have uh, enabled the public supervision and empowered public supervision and enabled uh, uh, the uh, market solutions like green supply chain and green finance. Um, and this has helped with the improvement of uh, air quality um, uh, with the concentration of uh, PM 2.5 in Beijing uh, dropping from uh, dropping by half uh, since 2013. The most exciting function of the map uh, is to enable users to take a picture uh, of any animals and plants 
and to instantly recognize the species, the name of the species through um, artificial intelligence technology, um, and 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 to enable them to pull out the all the uh, information and knowledge about it. The photo will be uploaded uh, uh, on a digital map and contribute to crowdsourcing based citizen science study of all the migration and uh, and habitats. Uh, it also means to facilitate the public to report illegal wildlife trafficking. Ladies and gentlemen, COP15 will be uh, hosted in China next year. I hope we can overcome the pandemic at that time and uh, gather in Kunming uh, to reveal how to build a more transparent, partic participatory, multi-stakeholder uh, mechanism. Uh, I trust that, uh, that such a mechanism will enable all of us to work together uh, uh, to build a shared future for all life on our beautiful planet Earth. Thank you. Thank you, Majun. Um, and now our final speaker, Jennifer Morgan, Executive Director of Greenpeace International. Over to Jennifer, please. Hello, I'm Jennifer Morgan, Executive Director of Greenpeace International, and I'd like to thank the Global Landscape Forum for inviting me to share an important message with you today that is very dear to me about climate change, nature, and people. As we look around in 2020, our planetary crisis couldn't be more clear. We face mega fires, violent hurricanes, intense floods, longer droughts, and species extinction at an unprecedented level. Of course, now we are also confronting a global pandemic because we humans simply have pushed nature to its absolute limits. Earth is screaming with all its might. Business as usual backed by polluted politics is the problem. The same destructive systems that are stripping our forests and oceans of life are killing environmental defenders and pushing others into peril. This must stop. To reset our relationship with nature, we need to change the way we produce and consume food, energy, and natural resources. A decade ago, governments made a commitment to protect biodiversity and nature, but as we all know, they failed on almost all targets and commitments, and as a result, nature is at a breaking point. With the CBD in May 2021, we have a few crucial months ahead of us to set a new direction. It is not possible to stay within a 1.5 degrees Celsius target without dramatically reducing emissions from fossil fuels, from our use of land, and increasing the carbon uptake capacities of nature. We cannot count one against the other. All three measures are critical. We must be vigilant and not allow false solutions to dominate the debate, such as using precious land to offset the burning of fossil fuels. And to survive this climate and biodiversity crisis, we must make large parts of land and oceans off limits to industrial exploitation. This does not mean that we can establish new lofty protection goals at the expense of people and their rights, especially those of local communities and indigenous peoples. The moment is now to reckon with the failures of fortress conservation which has evicted too many communities and inflicted grave injustices without succeeded in protecting biodiversity. To turn the tide on nature destruction, decision makers must listen to, support, and respect those who have lived in harmony with the land the longest. They possess knowledge we need to survive. More protection must mean a global push to demarcate and legally recognize customary lands for indigenous peoples and local communities and ensure that their rights are protected. Access and sustainable usage by indigenous and local communities must therefore be integral to the concept of protection. Any decisions we make in the next few years are critical. We cannot afford to get this wrong. As we craft these solutions, we must address the interconnectedness of climate change, biodiversity, inequality, and injustice simultaneously. We can't improve upon some while making others worse. We can't let corporations and private interests dictate the agenda. We need governments to step up and act and listen to what people want before it really is too late. 
Justice must be the guiding principle for planetary recovery. I thank you for your time and let us work forward together. Wow, what an emphatic end um, and very fitting um, end to the session. Jennifer's rally for us to review our relationship with nature and center the rights of local communities and indigenous peoples is exactly what we'll speak to in our final plenaries later today. These are the voices of the Landscapes Plenary and the Transformative Change, a collective call for global action plenary, which will take us um, almost up to the end of um, the conference. Thank you for all your comments. We've been seeing them um, stream in. Thank you for watching and um, we hope to see you in the next sessions. Thank you.